Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wild Side of STEAM, where we explore the unusual careers in science, technology, engineering, art, and math at the Smithsonian's National Zoo. My name is Shelly, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be your host for today. Today, we are celebrating World Migratory Bird Day, and in a couple of minutes, we'll meet our guest and hear all about her unusual zoo job, avian research ecologist. While we wait for more friends to join, you're going to see two quick poll questions pop up on your screen. Do you know what an avian ecologist does, yes or no? And did you know that bird populations are declining, yes or no? While you take a moment to submit your answers, I'm going to go over the format of the webinar today. First, I do want to say how excited we are to be partnering with the Environment for the Americas, who is live streaming this program on their website to continue celebrating World Migratory Bird Day. Today's program will be about 40 to 45 minutes, with an additional 15 minutes at the end to answer as many questions as we can. The webinar is live captioned. You'll want to note, locate that CC button at the bottom of your screen for those to appear. And you will also see that today we are providing American Sign Language interpretation. If you run into trouble viewing these services, please message us so that we can have a team member assist you. Remember that today's program is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you, um, and nor can you see or hear each other. However, we are so excited to interact with you in a number of other ways. As you already saw, we will be issuing a few polls throughout the program. And additionally, you will see that the Q&A is open as well. Please use that Q&A at any time throughout today's program to ask any questions uh, for me or our guests. Try to keep your questions on topic and only ask um, your questions once. We will see them and try to get to them. You can check under the My Questions column to see if your question was already answered. Lastly, you will see that the chat feature is open for you to message us as well. And I want you to now find that chat box and tell me your name, where you're joining us from, and if you have a favorite migratory bird. And while you throw your answers in the chat, I do want to introduce some of my colleagues who are helping behind the scenes. Today we have Erica, Caden, Jess, and Casey helping to respond to your chat and Q&A. And we actually have three special chat experts joining from the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. We have Justine, Mary, and Alexander also helping to answer your Q&A. Now, wow, we have so many people joining from all over. Oh my goodness. We have Mrs. Toy's second grade class from Washington County, Maryland. We have some folks from New York City, Arav, Muhammad. Hi, Asher. Um, Ms. Ohalvo's class is excited to be here. We're so excited to have you. Capitol Hill Montessori, James Doherty Elementary. PS236 loves all birds. That's great. We also love all birds. Naomi from Massachusetts. Jacqueline from Connecticut. Hi, Leah from Dublin, California. Um, Miss McCarter's second grade class in Hagerstown. That's so wonderful. Timmy from Virginia. Miss Carpenter's class from Bealesville High School. More folks from Dublin. Miss Bray's class at James Doherty, Purna, hello. Oh my God, how fun is this? Uh, Anna from Los Angeles, you love swans. That's a great favorite bird. Hi, Skyla from Houston Elementary School. Miss Crump, Miss Wright. Oh my goodness, oh, fox sparrows. And we have people from DC as well. And Michigan, all right. So many great uh, places and so many great favorite birds. So once again, I wanna welcome everyone to the Wild Side of STEAM. I am so thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Ruth Bennett, research ecologist at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. Hi Ruth and welcome. Hi Shelly, it's so nice to be here. Hello to everybody that's joined in. I'm Ruth, I use she, her pronouns and happy World Migratory Bird Day. Wonderful. Why don't you start by telling us what it is you do for the zoo? Yeah, so I'm an avian research ecologist, and not everybody knows what that means, but we can break it down. So avian just means birds. So I work with birds. Research means that I study birds. 
And ecologist means that I study the interactions between different things in nature. So my job actually looks at trees, especially in the tropics on coffee farms, uh, what kind of insects use those trees, how birds eat those insects, interact with the insects and the trees over the coffee. So we're actually studying full ecosystems and how all of the components of them work together uh, to support and house the birds that we love. That's really, really cool and so important to recognize how important entire ecosystems are. So I know that in your career, you do quite a bit of traveling to Central and South America to study these birds. Can you tell us a little bit about what a migratory bird is and why these locations are so important? Yeah, so there's lots of different types of birds with different his life histories strategies that allow them to survive. And some birds, the ones that I study, live in one place for part of the year and then travel very far distances, like from Canada all the way down to South America and spend the entire winter in South America. Uh, so those birds we call migratory. The reason they do that is because food resources are not equal all over the planet at all times. So when it's our winter up here in North America, a lot of those insects that they eat go away, they die, they go underground, they go into the trees. So these migratory birds need to travel to other parts of the world to find those insects so that they can survive to come all the way back up here and breed next year. Uh, so because of that, I do a lot of travel too. I study birds on both sides of their migratory journey. So here in the United States, I work around Pennsylvania and in New York, uh, studying birds while they're nesting. And then in the fall, when they take off, I also uh, get on a plane and travel down to Central and South America and study the birds where they overwinter, primarily in coffee and cocoa uh, agroforestry systems, which we'll talk a little bit more about today. Yes, I'm so excited to learn more about these coffee programs that you work with. Before we jump into that, I do want to know, how did you become interested or how did you become aware of this as a career? Yeah, so when I was younger, I did not know the career that somebody could have. And I actually probably wouldn't have been interested in it when I was in middle school. So when I was young, I didn't really like the outdoors. I was scared of spiders and bees and snakes. And I associated going to the forest with being around all of those bugs that I really didn't like. Uh, so I was really lucky actually, as I uh, kept getting a little older to have some friends that, that showed me that the outdoors is more than scary insects. Uh, they showed me that when you go to the forest, you can hear a lot of different bird songs. You can see a huge diversity of things. Uh, right now, uh, it's wildflower season. You can see all these different wildflowers. You can find raspberries, blueberries. So there's a lot to, to have being outside. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really lucky to have had people that helped me overcome my fear of the outdoors uh, so that I could become the avian research ecologist that I am today. Wow, I never would have guessed that you were once afraid of the outside, especially with how much field work you're doing now. But I am really curious from our audience about how they have um, interacted with birds before. So I'm going to launch another poll for our viewers. I'm curious, how have you interacted with birds? Have you maybe hung a bird feeder, listened for birds singing or calling, gone bird watching, maybe observed birds diving to catch fish? Maybe you found a bird's nest or even seen birds at a zoo, whether the national zoo or another zoo closer to you. This is, seems to be such an easy way to start building a connection to nature. And um, just maybe like Ruth, eventually you'll become a field researcher as well. So I'll give another few seconds for this poll. We have so many answers coming in already. All right, I'll give folks another five, four, three, two, one. Let's see. I'll share these results. So it looks like so many of our audience members have listened for birds singing or calling, followed closely by seeing birds at zoos or even finding a bird's nest. That's so great. All right. So again, at the beginning of this program, we saw that not a lot of people knew that bird populations are declining, especially in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit more, Ruth, about why birds are declining? Yeah, so our center has been involved in some research that has shown that since the 1970s, 3 billion birds have been lost from North America. Wow. That's 
that's a crazy number, right? I don't, it's hard for me to think about how many birds 3 billion birds is, but it's about 25% of all of the bird individuals that, that would have been alive back in 1970 no longer exist. Wow. Lots of reasons that's happening. Um, but one of the things we found is that if birds are migratory, like the ones I study, if they breed in one place and travel long distances and over winter somewhere else, those birds are the ones that are most likely to threats and going through population declines. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. One of the primary ones is habitat loss. So birds need specific food resources, specific shelter and nesting sites in order to survive. And as humans take over the planet, as climate change is accelerating, those habitats are becoming smaller in their patch size and less and less frequent. But also migratory birds face a lot of threats as they migrate. So if you're a tiny songbird traveling 3,000 miles, uh, you encounter a lot of different things along the way. Most of these birds migrate at night, which most people don't know, uh, and they use the moon and the stars to help navigate. But when they come through areas with cities and a lot of bright lights, they can get disoriented, confused by those lights. They might think it's the moon or the stars, and they'll just spin around and around in circles and sometimes hit windows. Um, they also come in contact with feral cats, um, uh, animals that people let outside, and those cats can eat them. So there's a lot of different things that make migration dangerous for them. They also often have to fly all the way across the Gulf of Mexico in one shot, and that's a dangerous journey. If there's wow. a that comes through, they may not make it over. So all of those things together, habitat loss, um, and these dangerous migratory journeys mean that these birds are going through, um, yeah, some major threats and it's a dangerous time for them. Absolutely. And I just want to point out something that is so unique, especially about our migratory birds is when we're protecting this habitat, we're not just protecting or need to protect just one of their habitats because they're migrating and not just their wintering grounds and their breeding grounds. It's all of those stopover locations on the way that need protecting. That's so, that seems like we need to do a lot of work to protect them. Um, so this work that you're doing in Central and South America to protect these winter um, habitats, can you talk to us a little bit about what this work is? Yeah, so a lot of these migratory birds fly to Central and South America and spend the winter in middle elevation zones. So those are areas that now have a lot of coffee that's grown there. And I personally love coffee. I've already had several cups of coffee. This Me as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but it's great to think about the fact that that coffee is actually coming from these areas where these migratory birds spend the winter. So there's a lot that we can do actually to protect habitat on these coffee farms. And that's what a lot of my work is focused on. So coffee can be grown in a bunch of different types of agricultural systems. Traditionally, coffee evolved as uh, as an understory shrub in Ethiopia, where it grew in the forest in the understory. So completely closed canopy, very shady conditions. And coffee can still be grown in those types of conditions with a lot of trees above it. And if you have a lot of trees over your coffee, you're going to have a lot of birds that can use that habitat. Um, yeah, we're looking at the coffee cherries here. And uh, that's one of our field technicians walking through a coffee farm in Colombia, actually. So you can see there's some nice trees there. That tree is probably full of migratory birds if it's the winter. Um, but coffee is not always grown in these great bird-friendly light conditions. Uh, more and more coffee uh, is being grown in industrial monocultures. And what that means is all of the shade trees are removed, all of the native vegetation is removed, and you only have the coffee bushes themselves that are producing coffee. So we've done some research in Peru, that's what we're looking at here on this slide, that shows that in full sun coffee, in this industrial monoculture, you can maybe have 61 bird species that live there. If you mix some shade into it, so a few fruit trees, a couple native forest trees, you can get 70, 80 species of birds, but what we call bird friendly shade grown coffee that can have 243 species of birds just on the coffee farm itself. Uh, so our center is conducting research to understand what kinds of trees, what kind of habitat are great for birds in coffee. And then we run a certification program called bird friendly coffee that tells consumers 
people like you or your parents that purchase coffee, that coffee came from a farm that had great habitat for migratory birds on it. This is so fascinating. So it seems like what was once a practice of deforestation to create coffee farms, just by creating these bird-friendly shade-grown coffee, all of these bird species, these important migratory bird species that we're losing can now have new habitat. And it seems like this could potentially bring other wildlife back to these habitats as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we've done research that shows that bird-friendly levels of shade those coffee farms have more insects, they have more mammals, they can actually have like monkeys and sloths, all sorts of really cool animals that you normally don't have in agricultural systems. And I wanna mention that the birds actually give back to coffee farmers as well. They, they eat small insects normally, and some of those insects damage the coffee plants, they can damage the leaves, they can actually damage the coffee grain that we roast and toast and uh, drink. And so having migratory birds on your coffee farm means that farmers don't have to spend as much money controlling these insect pests. Um, so having bird friendly uh, shade on your farm is better for birds, and it's also better for coffee farmers. That's really wonderful. We do have a great question in the Q&A already of do the birds eat the coffee beans or the fruits? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are a couple bird species that will eat the coffee cherries, but very few birds do that. So the coffee bean itself has high caffeine content that can be toxic for birds. So most birds won't actually eat the coffee berry itself. They're much more interested in all of the insects that are in the coffee that they can eat, and especially the insects that are in those shade trees above the coffee. And the insects are going to be really high in those fats to help them prepare for their journey migrating back up north, right? Yeah, yes. So uh, it takes a lot of energy for a bird to make it all the way back to the United States. So by uh, stopping and eating a lot of insects on coffee farms, and if there's any forest next to it, eating insects in those forests helps these migratory birds put on enough fat that they can, that's, that's their fuel. Um, and they burn that fat as they cross the Gulf of Mexico and make it all the way back up into the United States and Canada. That's really, really neat. Now I'm so excited to hear even more about this coffee. Um, and I know that I think Jess in the chat dropped a link where you can actually find a coffee shop or um, someplace that sells coffee near you that potentially sells bird-friendly coffee. So check that link. Now, Ruth, I know that you study just a ton of different species of birds, and I actually want to give our audience a chance to pick which bird they would like to hear a little bit more about. So I'm going to launch this poll, and I want to know from our audience, would you rather hear about the migration pattern of a summer tanager or a golden winged warbler? And I think we'll have a picture of those so you can pick which one. Oh, we have tons of votes coming in already. I'll give folks another few seconds. Um, do you want to name some of the other fun species that you might work with? Uh, sure. So for migratory birds, I work with lots and lots of different warbler species. So in coffee farms, we have cerulean warblers, Canada warblers, Kentucky warblers, black pole warblers, blackburnian warblers. There are so many warblers and they're all really cute, just like that little golden wing warbler. Uh, and they all like hanging out in the shade trees above coffee. Um, I also work with some bigger birds like the summer tanager, wood thrush. Um, yeah, so lots of diversity. Awesome. All of them have their own songs, their own plumage, and their own behaviors. I love that. All right, I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. And let's see, it looks like we want to hear about the golden winged warbler. But it was a pretty close one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the golden winged warbler is one of my favorite birds. This is the bird species that I studied both for my master's and my PhD. Uh, and it's a bird that's actually, uh, it's threatened. It's going through really steep population declines and it overwinters in the highlands of Central and South America uh, in areas that grow a lot of coffee, which is why I study it, and coffee. Um, the picture that we're looking at here is a male golden wing warbler. So you can see it's got that black throat patch and a black eye line. And I also study female golden wing warblers, which look a little bit different. They've got some gray on their eye and a gray mask. 
And one of the things I discovered as I was studying them is that female golden wing warblers spend the winter in different landscapes and different habitats than males. So you might think that they would all be together, the females and the males would wanna be together, but that's not the case. They're not breeding, they're not nesting when they're in Central America. And so the females actually get kicked out from, by the males from the best quality habitat, and they have to travel down the mountain into drier habitats, and that's where they spend the winter. That's really interesting. So where in the U.S. are these golden-winged warblers migrating to? Or yeah. from? Um, so right now it's migration season. You can find them all across the eastern United States, um, but they primarily live now in the area around Minnesota in regenerating aspen plantations and wetlands. Uh, so there's still a few golden wing warblers you can find in the Appalachias that used to have a lot, but now they've experienced 95% population declines in the Appalachias. So it's pretty hard to find them there now. Uh, and what we're looking at here on the slide is a golden wing warbler that I actually caught in Guatemala oh, on wow. a farm and put a radio transmitter on its back, uh, something called a geolocator. And this is its migration pattern. So we caught the bird in Guatemala one year, found it again the next year, took that backpack off, downloaded the data, and this is what it revealed. That bird migrated north, it crossed the Gulf of Mexico, and it bred in somewhere in Minnesota. Wow. So you mentioned a couple of these tracking techniques that I would love for you to talk a little bit more about. Obviously, this is the wild side of STEAM. So we're talking about science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So what sorts of technology are you using to catch and track these birds? Yep, we use a lot of different technologies. Some of them are very simple technologies. Some of them are really cutting edge. Uh, and brand new. So the one you see on the bottom left there, leg bands, that's a technology that we've used to track migratory birds for over a century. Uh, so we catch birds in mist nets, which are these big, uh, very lightweight, almost invisible nets. And as birds are flying, they hit those nets, fall into little bags in them, like that golden wing warbler I'm looking at there. Uh, and then trained researchers like myself just reach in, take that bird out, and then we can put some bands on its legs. If they're color bands, we, we don't have to catch that bird again. We can just use our binoculars and we know which individual it is and where it was captured. Um, you can see I'm taking some measurements of a bird here. We're figuring out how long its wings are, how much it weighs, what kind of condition it's in. Uh, and then we use a lot of tracking technologies as well to study these birds and to follow them through migration. Uh, so yeah. on golden wing warblers, I use geolocators. They're just 0.3 gram tags, so very, very lightweight tags uh, that are a super simple technology. All they have in them is a clock and a light sensor. And with that information, we can figure out when sunrise is and when sunset is for that bird. And with that information, we can figure out latitude and longitude of where it's at on the planet. Um, but on the right here, you see there's a yellow-billed cuckoo that's wearing a satellite transmitter. So that's a much more complicated technology that transmits continuously to a satellite in space. And we can download the data in real time to see where that bird is, where it's going until the tag falls off or dies. That's really, really cool and sounds like a varying levels of technology and science. And I do just want to point out that I think we have a lot of friends who happen to join our Wednesday webinar too with Dr. Brian Evans, and they might have seen some of this banding. Um, Dr. Brian Evans did it for us live during the webinar of how we put those bands. And just want to reiterate for um, our viewers that again, these mist nets don't hurt the birds. The birds fly into them, fall into a pocket, and allows um, all of our researchers and scientists to apply these tracking devices that again, don't hurt them, and then release them. And all of this valuable information that we gather just from tracking them. That's really, really cool. So it sounds like this can be a lot of work and you might have some pretty long days out in the field, but I imagine you have some pretty fun and exciting stories that happen. Anything you would like to share? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So uh, catching birds is always an adventure. Something always happens. Uh, one of the stories I really love is that uh, all of these birds that we catch, when they're trying to take off and fly, they like to poop before they do that. And so if I'm holding a bird, you generally hold it between your two little fingers and grab, grab its legs. 
And the, boot, the bird will sit there and poop on your hand as you're doing that. Uh, so I was once in Honduras catching a lot of wood thrush and those are birds that eat purple berries. So their poop, as you might imagine, is purple. Uh, and my hands were actually stained purple because of that. So I could wash it off my hands, but on my nails, the purple color just stayed there. So later that day, somebody asked me where I got my nice nail polish. And I didn't have the heart to tell them that it actually just came from the bird poop. <laughs> that is something that we have really learned a lot of through this series is how important poop is to a lot of zoo careers. It tells us a lot, especially about what the animals eat, but what a funny little anecdote. And I do just <laughs> want to note that Saba must have joined us for our Wednesday program. They noted that the bands are like bracelets. Exactly. They don't hurt the bird. It's just like wearing a bracelet so that we can identify them from such a big distance. That was really great. And just another follow-up question from Jacqueline. Uh, they wanted to know about how you attach the trackers to the birds. Yeah. So they're kind of like a little backpack. Um, so we have the tracker itself. And then I typically glue two bands of uh, actually of bracelet wire. That's what we use to attach these birds. Uh, we use a bracelet wire that you can buy at any bracelet store, even at Walmart or Hobby Lobby, anything like that. So we create two little loops, glue them to the ground, the legs of the birds. So just like us, birds have legs and then their, uh, their stomach or waist area is a little bit skinnier. So we can move both of the bracelets above their leg joints and then they tuck right in there and the bird will carry that around until we take it off or in some cases until the tracker falls off. Oh, very cool. That was a great question. And there's another question here following up um, from Kavans. Sorry if I say your name incorrectly. Um, where do golden winged warblers migrate? So we mentioned that you said the Minnesota area and then where specifically in Central or South America were you finding them? Sure. Uh, yeah, their overwintering population is mid elevation areas from Western or from Eastern Guatemala through Colombia and Venezuela. So the majority of the population, actually we know now that golden wings have two distinct populations. So the birds that breed in Minnesota all go to Central America. The birds that breed in the Appalachias, those birds all go to South America. So that's the population that's really steeply declining. Mm. So if you find a golden wing warbler in coffee growing areas of Colombia or Venezuela, that bird almost certainly bred in Pennsylvania or New York or Vermont. And if you find birds in Honduras, Guatemala, Panama, those birds came from Minnesota. That's really fascinating. And that's through all of this research of studying and tracking these birds that we've identified these two separate populations. That's really, really fascinating. Um, so you, you mentioned, obviously, you're working with tons of different species of birds and tracking them. With all of this work that you're doing in Central and South America, I imagine that you're working a lot with the farmers themselves on how they can assist these migratory birds and make uh, shade-grown coffee. Yeah, one of my favorite parts of my job is that I don't just work with birds, we also work with people that take care of those birds. Uh, so I started working with coffee farmers in Honduras uh, while I was a Peace Corps volunteer. So um, many years ago now, I, I lived in Honduras for, for three years. Uh, and this guy that we're looking at here is Don Jose Mendoza. He is a coffee farmer that lives at the base of a mountain uh, where he has his coffee farms that also has some great forest on it. And um, because I was studying golden wing warblers, because I was working in Honduras with Peace Corps, I got to meet Don Jose and actually go with him. It's a three and a half hour hike uh, from his house up to his coffee farm on the mountain. And we found a ton of golden wing warblers up there and blue wing warblers like this bird on the right, which are closely related to golden wing warblers. And Don Jose loves the migratory birds. He always had stories for me every time I would come and visit him about what the birds were doing, which birds were fighting with other birds, which birds had crazy populations coming through. Uh, so he knew everything about what was happening with wildlife on his mountain. And the reason golden wing warblers were on that mountain is because Don Jose and his neighbors had protected habitat for them. So the coffee that's up there is all bird friendly levels of coffee. It's what we would call rustic shade. Uh, there's forest next to it. It has a ton of native shade trees, primary forest trees in many cases that are mixed in with the coffee. And because Don Jose 
protected that habitat, that's why golden wing warblers are found on that mountain today. That's so wonderful. And I know we have a ton of students joining us from various classes today. You do some work with schools as well down there, correct? Yeah, yeah, especially while I was living in Honduras. Um, I worked with elementary schools and some middle schools, teaching kids about birds and also training university students in Honduras to teach uh, these, these elementary and middle school kids about birds. Uh, so one of my favorite events that I did was a World Migratory Bird Day event in Honduras for kids there because the same birds that we're celebrating here in the U.S. right now, we also celebrate all throughout Central and South America because those birds are in both places. Uh, so you can see here we uh, we did this, we called it uh, Feria de las Aves Florias, uh, basically the same type of event we're doing here in the United States, uh, but teaching kids about the migratory birds. You can see we have a pinata there of a summer tanager. Um, so, and we did some banding events. You can see down there in the bottom, just like the event that Dr. Evans did a few days ago for you guys. Um, we took all these kids out. We showed them how we catch birds and then we actually let the kids release the birds. Um, and then we just, yeah. Oh, That's and we have, uh, yeah, Samuel, who's a uh, son of a guy that I used to work with trapping golden wing warblers. And Samuel would come out with me. He was also a student in that area and help, uh, help us as we were doing our research. And in some cases, he would get to release the birds as we let them back. That's so great. So all of you students watching, for you being here and celebrating World Migratory Bird Day with us, there are also students your age, your peers down in Central and South America who are celebrating those exact same birds because we're both seeing them. That's really, really neat. Now we have some great questions um, about why we're trying, Mohammed asked why we're trying to protect birds and what are some things that all of us can do to help protect birds? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm so glad that people are thinking about how we can help protect birds because we are really the reason that these birds are, uh, are going through these population declines. So all of you as students out there or any adults that are on the, on the call, there are a lot of simple actions take to live lifestyles that are friendlier for birds. So we would call this living bird friendly. Um, I'll, I'll just go through some of the actions here that you can take. The first one is turning out your lights at night while birds are migrating through or putting blinds or stickers on your windows so birds don't run into those windows. Super simple action. Everybody that has a window in their life can take this action. Um, and that really helps birds as they're migrating not to hit those windows um, or if they're just uh, feeding in your backyard, it helps them and protects them. If you have a house cat, you can also protect migratory birds by keeping that cat inside. So cats, as you might know, like to eat things that move outside uh, and they like to eat migratory birds, especially when they're moving through. So especially in that migration period as we're celebrating World Migratory Bird Day, just keep your cat inside for, for a month or two until the birds have migrated through that nesting period's over. Or if you're able, keep your cat inside all the time. Um, you can also, Make your backyard, if you have a backyard, friendlier for birds by planting native plants. So outside in people's yards, we like to have flowers, we like to have ornamental plants, but there's a lot of plants that are native to your area that are also beautiful, have flowers, are ornamental. Those plants have better food for birds. They have higher quality berries that they produce and they have a lot more insects that hang out on them. So native plants really help birds, uh, especially as they're migrating and need that protein source to continue on migration. Uh, if you're managing your backyard, you can also help birds by not putting out pesticides. So pesticides um, or spraying anything, that kills the insects that those birds eat. And birds need food in order to survive, feed their babies and continue migrating. Uh, you can also help birds by drinking bird-friendly coffee. So as we talked about earlier, our coffee can come from places that provide great habitat for migratory birds during the winter. So if you purchase coffee yourself, if you drink coffee, or if you have someone in your life that really likes coffee, tell them to buy coffee that has the bird-friendly label on it. Uh, it's easy, you can find it in any Whole Foods, you can find it on our website. 
Uh, and that coffee really, you know, 100% of the coffee in that bag came from a coffee farm managed by somebody like Don Jose Mendoza, uh, who is creating and providing great habitat for migratory birds. Um, another simple action you can take is using less plastic. If you use plastic water bottles, think about uh, getting a water bottle that you use over and over again. If you're out walking and you see plastic water bottles or any trash, you can pick that up and clean it up and it creates uh, lakes and beaches and areas that are better for birds. And finally, one of my favorite actions is you yourselves can go out and watch birds and record your observations on a platform or in a cell app like eBird. So no matter what skill level you have with birds, even if the only bird you can identify right now is a crow, you can go out and watch those crows, count how many crows are in your area and put that into the eBird application. And all of those sightings together go to help, uh, help scientists at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology figure out where birds are for the entire year. And that helps us figure out where we need to work to protect them. So these are seven simple actions that you can take to live more bird friendly. That's so great. And I know that just popped um, our website into the chat for you to explore these several, seven simple actions a little bit more in depth. We do have a great um, question too. What is the bird friendly symbol that folks can look for um, on coffee for that certification? Yeah, so I think we probably have something we can share here that shows the symbol, uh, but it's a square. It's normally blue and it says bird friendly on it. Uh, it has two little birds flying and one tree. So, you know, it's protecting tree habitat for birds. Wonderful. Uh, yep, that's the symbol there. Bird friendly Smithsonian. That is the label that you look for on coffee bags. And if you can't find it on the coffee you love, you can ask the people that sell that coffee, whether it's at a grocery store or a roaster or a coffee shop that uh, ask them to carry bird friendly coffee because they can find it. That's so great. And again, I think on that website as well, you'll be able to find that resource so you can find roasters or coffee shops near you that do sell bird friendly coffee. And additionally, in that um, on that website, you can also put in your zip code and find what plants are native to your area so you can plant native plants uh, to keep your backyards or your front yards bird friendly. That's really, really cool. Um, so now, after going through all of these awesome actions that everyone can take to help protect these birds, I do want to hear from all of our friends watching. What will you do to help birds? Are you going to help to keep your cats inside, apply decals to windows, plant these native plants, you can choose organic produce, drink bird-friendly coffee, reduce, reuse, recycle, or maybe even help clean up your neighborhood. I'll give you folks a few minutes to answer those questions and you can select all that you think you'll do. I know I'm gonna to try to do most of these. And while we have them answer that, Ruth, do you have any advice for young people interested in getting started or learning more about this field? Sure, so, um... This is a great question because we really need everybody to work to conserve migratory birds. This is a problem that's it's big. It has a lot of different reasons why it's happening. So no matter who you are, I would, I would challenge you to think about what you like and how what you like can help migratory birds. So for example, if you're somebody that loves animals, then teach yourself, download the Merlin app, um, it's a great app. It's free. It's developed by Cornell. It will help you identify the birds in your area. So figure out how to start identifying some of these birds. And as you do, start sharing those observations. Uh, yeah, this is the Merlin app right here. So you can choose what size the bird is, what the colors are, and then it will provide you photos of birds that are common in your area right now. And you can select which one is the bird you're looking at and read a little bit more about it. But if you're somebody who say, you don't really love animals, you don't wanna look at birds yourself, but you really love computers, be a computer person. We need people who understand uh, science and math and numbers and can run statistics about what bird populations are doing. So even if you don't wanna be the person that's going outside yourself and looking at birds, you can do, um, you can use any of those skills 
to do something that will help birds. Uh, if you're somebody that loves talking to people, if you have a lot of friends, tell your friends bird-friendly stories. Tell them about how their coffee can, uh, and their coffee purchases can impact bird populations. Tell them about how keeping their cats inside can protect birds during migration. So no matter who you are, there's something you can do uh, to, to help migratory birds. And I think this is really important because birds are for everybody. Birds are not just for scientists. Birds are not just in a zoo. They're not just on a coffee farm. All of us can see birds anywhere at any time. And we really wanna make the field of bird watching and bird conservation more accessible. Uh, we want this to be something that everybody, no matter who you are, can get passionate about and can learn to enjoy and can contribute to. I love that. And we have some great comments coming in. Arav's just said that birds are important to us. They absolutely are. And Muhammad said that he's going to try to do all of those actions to help protect birds. And Ruth, I just want to reiterate everything that you just said, talking about there is a role for everybody in bird conservation and all wildlife conservation. And that's just the goal of this webinar series has been to expose everybody to the diversity of careers in conservation that you don't need to be a field researcher. You could be really great at computers or really great at math or great at communication and still play such an important role in conservation. That's so great. Now, Ruth, we have a ton of wonderful questions coming into the Q&A if you are ready for them. Let's do it. All right. So starting off, Lisa wanted to know why do birds migrate? Why can't they just stay in one, one maybe more warmer spot year round? Yeah. So actually in those warmer spots, like all throughout the tropics, there are lots of birds that just stay there all year long. But up here in the northern latitudes, uh, we have these strong winters. Those winters mean that there are seasonal fluctuations in resources. So berries and fruits and seeds are not available there all year long, but when they are available, they're super abundant. And so birds have developed this strategy of migrating. They spend the winter in the tropics where it's a little warmer, where there's more stable food resources, but then they come to, the, to North America when we have these like massive explosions in insects and fruits and food. And those big explosions in resources, that's what allows them to breed and reproduce. So it's really costly for them. They need a lot of food to raise babies. And so they migrate specifically to do that, to take advantage of those food resources that are only available for a short amount of time. Very cool. And I know that we saw with the golden winged warbler that we saw these two distinct populations, but do other migrating birds also stop in the same areas to rest and feed on their journeys? Yeah. So we are learning a lot right now about where birds rest and how they refuel during migration. So we know that there are some key spots and those spots are different in the, in the spring when birds uh, come north. And those are different from the fall spots where they migrate in the south or where they go south. So along the coast of Texas, a lot of birds cross the Gulf of Mexico and they will spend um, uh, they'll spend some time hanging out in vegetation right on the coast of Texas, trying to. Um, sorry, somebody's at the door. That's OK. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, we all love our animals, even our pets. <laughs> um, wonderful. So it sounds like we have. <laughs> so I, there's a question of what my favorite bird is in the meantime. And I have to say that I think in the meantime, my favorite bird has been the rosette spoonbill. I know it's not a migratory bird, but I just had the pleasure of doing some Amazonia programs earlier this year. And that rosette spoonbill was always down to be on camera and just feel very curious in what we were doing. <laughs> yeah, I, so I don't have just one specific favorite bird. I, whatever bird I'm looking at at the moment is typically my favorite bird. Cause then you get to hear it call, you get to see all of its different feathers. Um, but I'm actually in California right now. And last weekend I saw California condors. So I would say right now, that's my favorite bird. Uh, oh, wow. They're huge, they're the biggest, they've got the biggest wingspan of any bird in North America. And they almost went extinct a couple decades ago. There were actually only 22 
two individuals left in the wild and uh, a zoo program actually helped to save these birds. So all of the ones that were left in the wild were taken into captivity and started a breeding program and that has been successful. And now you can actually in California go out and see California condors again. That's really cool. And I remember from the beginning of this program that we did have a ton of friends joining from California. So maybe you all have seen them before, or have the chance to see them. We have a great question in here from Reha. When the babies um, of birds are born um, and they need to make this migration journey, how do they know where they're going? That's a great question. That's one that people like myself, research ornithologists or avian researchers have been studying for a long time. So uh, there are actually genes inside the bird that control this migration desire. So the, the feeling that when lights start to get low, when it's no longer summer, days are getting shorter, birds know it is time to go. And how far they travel and the direction that they travel uh, is partially controlled internally uh, through their genes. It's something that's passed on to them from their parents. And so even baby birds that were just born that year, their parents leave them and they group together with other birds and they just know they're gonna go south, they're gonna go about 3000 miles. Uh, and then the second year, then they have some knowledge, right? Then they know, ah, when I get to the Gulf of Mexico, this is what I do. Like, oh, this is the Mississippi River that I'm looking at. But for that first migration season, uh, it's primarily genetically controlled, we think. And one other really fun fact about birds is that they have very high iron content in their blood. And so over their eyes, there's blood vessels in their eyes, and they can actually use that iron content to help them know where north is. So iron has uh, some magnetic properties, and they can actually kind of see bands of, of shade, we think, uh, that tell them more or less where north is, and that helps them orient as well. Wow, that's really, really fascinating, and that is something I just learned today. Um, let's see here. Do they always, all species of bird migrate at the same time? So not at exactly the same time, but in the same season, typically. So the whole spring season is a migration period, but some birds are the first ones to migrate. Some birds are the first ones to arrive. And it kind of depends on what that bird is eating uh, and where it's going to, to try to breed. So birds move north with what we call the green wave. So as our deciduous forests in, in North America start to put leaves back on, birds tend to those leaves and go north with those leaves. Really cool. And there's a wonderful question from Lily and Levi. Are there any bird species that have stopped migrating over the years? Ooh, so there are some populations that we call partially migratory. Um, American robins are a really great example of this. Some robins, like the ones that breed in Alaska, all of those birds migrate. Uh, but in the central United States, those robins can find food resources to, to in the winter there. So in places like around DC, we'll be joined by robins that come from Canada and are migrating south. Some of our robins go south and some of our robins just stay in DC the whole year. Uh, so over time, uh, if that, that strategy, staying around the DC area is better, if those birds breed more, that population may become more sedentary over time. Wow, that's really fascinating. What a great question to start thinking about. And here's another really great one, sort of thinking into the future from Rick. Due to global warming, coffee production in Central and South America is expected to move gradually into higher elevations. What do you think this impact will be on migratory birds and their habitats? Yeah, this is, this is a big thing that's happening right now. So in Central America specifically, most of the areas right above where coffee is grown still have forest, primary forest. And it's typically a type of forest we call cloud forest because it's very humid. There's kind of a cloud level that sits on those mountains all day long. And as climate change is occurring, those areas are becoming suitable for coffee production for the first time. So in the past, you couldn't grow coffee there. It just wouldn't survive. And as they become suitable for coffee production, there's actually a lot of deforestation happening at that 
at that level, right where the cloud forest meets the coffee level. So this is something that coffee companies really need to think about. Are they going to source coffees from areas that are deforesting the cloud forest? Mm -hmm. um, so part of our program is trying to understand in a landscape, what patches of forest we want to conserve, what areas are okay to grow coffee in, and then how that coffee can be grown in the most environmentally and bird friendly way possible. Wow, that's really, really, really fascinating to think about and just even more important to emphasize the need to protect all of these habitats. Um, and Mari and Carlene want to know what made you want to study birds specifically? So um, I, after college, worked a bunch of different types of jobs with plants and different types of wildlife. I studied grasses in Montana. I removed invasive weeds in Washington State. In Arizona, I worked a job with roadkill. And after that roadkill job, I had a job in Colorado studying sage grouse. Sage grouse are these big chicken-like birds. Uh, they, they live in the high sagebrush area. And those were the first birds I personally felt a connection with. So I would go out every day. We had radio tra trackers on all of those birds. And so I would find them, the same birds, day after day after day. I watched how they moved, what they were eating, how they changed plumage over time. We got into the breeding season where, where they have this fascinating uh, thing called a lek. All of the males group together. They have these big air sacs that they inflate. They fan out their tail feathers and they dance around on these little dancing pads that attract the females to them. And after I had that experience, I was sold. I didn't want to work with roadkill anymore. I didn't want to work with grasses. I wanted to work with birds. That's a really great answer. <laughs> um, Sienna has a really great question. She pointed out you seem to be maybe able to speak Spanish. Is it important to learn multiple language languages? Absolutely. So in the Americas, our migratory birds all, all travel to Spanish-speaking areas, Portuguese-speaking areas, there's some French-speaking areas, um, some Creole-speaking areas. So learning another language, if you want to study a species that travels, is really important. So um, I actually, while I was a Peace Corps volunteer in, in Honduras, I had the chance to really improve my Spanish language skills. Um, so I would say absolutely, as you have opportunities to study another language, study that language, no matter what language it is, whatever language is of interest to you. Um, and it also makes the world more accessible to you. So I wouldn't be able to work with migratory birds on coffee farms if I didn't speak Spanish. Uh, and I have a lot of colleagues that work in Africa and speak French uh, and other African languages. And that allows them to study European migratory birds that spend their winters in parts of Africa. Wow. Another one came in. Are there any careers in wildlife conservation or bird conservation for folks who are maybe thinking of a career change? So maybe not students, but people who have already graduated? Sure. So um, I would say, the, the bird conservation world needs people with lots of different types of skill sets. Uh, there are careers studying migratory birds that you typically need a science degree for, a master's or a PhD if you want to lead research, uh, but we need people working with communications, uh, people working with art, people that can take bird stories and bird research stories and communicate those to the public in ways that matter to, to, to lots of different types of groups. So I would say, um, yeah, there's a lot of different opportunities. They may not be your traditional uh, bird research path, but if you are interested in bird research, then consider studying birds for a master's or a PhD and, uh, and trying to find a research job. That's great advice. Uh, we had a couple more migration questions in here. Do birds ever migrate across like the ocean? Well, maybe from the United States to Europe or vice versa. So um, in the United States, every year we get birds from Europe that kind of blow across the ocean or get lost. So there aren't typically migration pathways from Europe to the United States and back, uh, but we do encounter regularly not super regularly, but you know, every year, a few of those birds do show up somewhere in the United States. Wow. Uh, 
There's also a lot of ocean going birds that migrate between oceans. Uh, so some of our, our colleagues in the Migratory Bird Center study birds like parasitic Jaegers, these giant uh, ocean going birds that spend almost their entire life in the ocean that breed in Alaska and can travel to all of the different oceans on the planet. Uh, so birds conduct some really fascinating migrations. Wow. Um... Here's a really interesting question. What would make a quality habitat? To be asked specifically about the uh, golden winged warbler, um, what makes that a suitable habitat that the males or the females come into and say, this is where I'm going to nest? Yeah, so we define habitat quality in a lot of different ways. On the winter, it's the quality of food resources that the golden winged warblers can eat that allow them to survive the winter, uh, be protected from predators and also deposit those fat resources that they need to migrate north. In the breeding season, quality habitat means a place that they can nest that's safe from predators and enough food resources to feed to their babies so that those babies can become independent and migrate down. Uh, and so we study all of those different things. We study uh, what the food resources are like, how big the breast muscles of the birds are, how much fat they have, what percentage of their nestlings, those little babies survive to independence. All of those things give us clues about uh, habitat quality. Great. Um, about how many migratory bird species are there in total? I'm not sure what the number is. <laughs> Um, I can tell you that there are over 40 species of migratory warblers just in the eastern North America alone. Um, and, and there's a difference between birds that do these like really long migrations versus birds that do just short migrations. So a bird might go from like Washington DC to Florida and back, um, or it might just go from Washington DC like two states down and back. So there's lots of different types of migrations. Um, and, but I don't want to tell you how many there are because I bet that number is not going to be correct. <laughs> Lots of birds. <laughs> Lots of them. Now we are running out of time and I do want to ask just this last question from Amari. What is your favorite thing about the zoo or your job and or your job? Yeah, so um, in pre-COVID times, I my office is at the National Zoo and I love that I can take my lunch break and just walk to the zoo and see not just birds, but all sorts of different types of animals. It's so cool. I love the red pandas that are at the National Zoo. Um, I love the, the American Trail exhibit where you see California sea lions and, and wolves and bald eagles. Um, so I, I think zoos are an incredible way to see up close animals that you would have basically no chance of seeing in the wild. Uh, and I love that the zoo gives that opportunity to everyone that lives in urban areas around the zoo. Um, it's, it's really a privilege to be able to see and interact with and learn from these incredible animals that are often very threatened in their natural habitats. I love that. And for those of you who didn't know, the zoo is reopening on May 21st. So you can check our website for more information on that. Now, Ruth, before we say goodbye, I do want to wish everybody, again, a happy beginning of World Migratory Bird Day. Ruth, thank you so much for joining us. This is our final episode of the Wild Side of Steam for this season. However, you can check out all of our previous episodes on our website or YouTube playlist and check back this fall for our new and upcoming programs. Ruth, I have learned so much today about your work migratory birds, the importance of bird-friendly coffee and cacao, and I know that our viewers did as well. Before we say goodbye, do you have any final words of advice for all of our viewers? Sure. In honor of this World Migratory Bird Day, I would challenge all of our viewers today to pick one thing that you can do today that's good for migratory birds. We discussed a lot of them on the program today. Think about what you can do. Just one thing. Do it today. And if you like it, and if it's easy, maybe do it tomorrow as well. Uh, and if you're really enthusiastic, do all of the things that are good for birds. <laughs> uh, take all of those simple, seven simple actions and put them in practice. Wonderful. 
And again, special thank you to the Environment for the Americas for partnering with us today for the webinar and streaming through your website. Um, if you are interested in tuning in for more World Migratory Bird Day programs, check out birddaylive.org uh, for their great lineup. So before we finish up here, you will see one last poll after watching this webinar. Did you learn something new about zoo careers, yes or no? And additionally, we would love your feedback on this webinar so that we can continue to learn and grow. A short survey will pop open in your web browser following the end of this webinar, or you can follow the link that will be put in the chat. Thank you again to everybody for joining us, and thank you to Ruth and the rest of the team from the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center for the wonderful insight into your career. And on behalf of the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, we hope you have a wild day. Bye.